Okay. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself here in a second, but uh, just by show of hands, how many Al-Anons are out there this afternoon? Oh, wonderful. Well, God bless you. Well, this one's for you. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm still pretty sick. I still love to listen to the sounds of opening cans. I did that once a while back in, in an AA conference and a uh, pretty big group of the fellow in the back, I guess, came worked his way up after the meeting, came out, wasn't too happy with me. He said, I don't appreciate you opening that can of beer. And, I, and of course, I, luckily I kept my Diet Pepsi here. So I assure you, this is not beer. But anyway, um, my name is Pat and I'm an Alanonic. And uh, I'm gonna tell you about that because a lot of people wonder they never heard that before, they're not very often, and they say, what the heck is an Alanonic? And uh, when I came in, finally, it took me a long time to surrender and, and get to this program. And uh, I, had, I had a problem. And uh, so my sponsor, when I finally got one, told me, you know, you need to, to do some understanding about, about alcoholism, you know? And uh, because I didn't, you know, I didn't believe alcoholism was a disease. And he said, you know, you need to get some literature. And I said, well, where do I go for that? He said, well, for me, he's, he's pure Al-Anon. He said, get the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and find out what al alcoholism is and what it's about. And so I did that. And in that, I think it's the second edition. There, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. I don't, I'm a pretty loud guy, but I didn't want to make sure. <laughs> so uh, I did that. In, in this, I don't know what chapter it was. It was uh, in the stories, of course, so it wasn't in the chapter. But it was uh, talked about uh, about alcoholism. And this gentleman who was doing the story, he said, you know, alcoholism is a, is a dual d um, disease. It's an allergy of the body coupled with an obsession of the mind. Now, you know, I, I figured out, I used to drink, but I quit and it wasn't a problem for me, but uh, I knew I didn't have that allergy. Um, you know, my whole family was alcoholic, um, both sides, um, and, but I, I, a brother and a sister, and none of the three of us happened to get that gene. And like I say, I didn't believe it was a, a gene anyway. I thought it was a bunch of bull. But he said, it's an allergy of the body coupled with the obsession of the mind. Now, I did have the obsession of the mind. My obsession, of course, was my wife. And, uh, but also, it just, uh, I just had an obsessive behavior. And I, I couldn't quite, I couldn't quite get it. You know, and I said, well, finally I said, if this guy talking to me is an alcoholic, then I must be an alanonic, you know? And I don't suffer from al alcoholism, but I do suffer from alanonism. And I, I believe that today. So uh, anyway, to start my story, uh, I'll probably tell a little bit with Candy because uh, last night she got to speak and it's my turn for a rebuttal. That's right. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> so, but you know what? I gotta tell you right off the bat, uh, most of what she said about me was true. And, um, and I, can, I can take that today because I believe it. And uh, in my story, I think you can figure that out. But, I guess, you know, because uh, we both have shared this weekend, we, uh, we were really, uh, had quite a story, in my opinion. Of course, everybody has a good, great story in the end if you, everything works out. But she, uh, she and I met at 14. Uh, it was in the summer before high school. And uh, she had had some girlfriends the night before on a Friday night, had a slumber party, and they were all talking about their boyfriends and blah, 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 and she was the only one of the girls that didn't have a boyfriend. And one of these girls that I knew, that, that knew me, said, well, I know who you can call your boyfriend. I know Pat. And he says, uh, he lives about two blocks away tomorrow morning. Let's go over there, and uh, you can meet him, and I'll tell you how you're gonna do it. So, and I'll just tell you what happened. I always happened to be in the house that Saturday morning, and the door, knocking the door, and uh, I go to answer it, and she says, hi, my name's Candy. And I didn't know that I was gonna be hearing that a lot later in life when, after she became an alcoholic. And uh, I said, well, hi, I'm Pat. And she says, 
you know, I, my skateboard is broken. You know, and back then, my generation, we invented skateboards. It was a two by four with, with roller skates on, on each end. And that was it. Well, you know, she, I guess, loosened up the skate a little bit. I said, yeah, I can't get my cape to ride my skateboard, it's broken. So I went back to the garage and I fixed it for her. And, and I got done and we came back. I said, well, gosh, it's really, I'm glad it works for you now. And of course, myself and a man, she's really cute. You know, I, I gotta, I gotta think about getting together with this this young girl. And uh, but you know what? I didn't do that. And uh, I don't know why. Believe it or not, I, I used to be a little shy. I guess, and 14 years old, you know, I didn't know anything. And uh, and we, besides that, right after maybe a month or so in school, in high school, freshman year, she started going with a guy that was one of my best friends. And I said, well, I can't, I can't cut in on him, you know. So two years went by, and uh, I finally got the courage to, to, uh, to ask her out. And I'll tell you how it happened. Uh, we were having, it was right before the uh, beginning of our, our junior year, and uh, we had football practice, you know. School hadn't started yet, but we had the two-a-day practices and stuff. And so uh, we decided after practice, a friend of mine, she was down in Laguna Beach, California, which is... We grew, up, we grew up in a little town in San Gabriel, California, and we went to San Gabriel High School. But this, so we, we went down to Laguna Beach to see these two gals that we knew were down there. She was working there for the summer, Laguna Art Festival. And, and so uh, we went down there and uh, we went, knocked on the door where she was staying. Her mom said, well, they're down at the beach. So they said, just go right down the stairs down here. And, and you know, so that's what I did. So I went down the stairs and we, the two girls were down there and they're just getting ready to lay out, you know, and they had these bikinis on, and uh, Candy uh, bent over to straighten out her towel, and uh, you know I go, I got an eyeful, and I said I fell in lust right then, <laughs> and not love, lust, and uh, so that's how I how I actually, and then the, a few days after that, I decided to ask her out um, for a date, and uh, that that was the start of our relationship, and you know we. We hit it off real well, and uh, finally by our senior year, you know, uh, it was getting ready to, uh, to graduate. And uh, so I was offered a football scholarship uh, to Arizona State, right here in the state. And uh, so Candy's making applications out for different colleges, and she says, well, I'll, uh, I'm going I'm to apply to Arizona State. And I said, okay, that'd be great. Well, she did, and she got accepted. And when it came time to go to school over there, uh, she came. We got together, and I said, "Candy, I'm I'm not going to go." And she said, "What are you talking about? You know, we're going to go together to Arizona State." I said, "I know, but I can't, I can't do it." And she said, "Well, why not? You know?" And, and I was honest. I said, "You know, it's a Division One school. I don't think I'm good enough to play college football." And she says, "Oh man!" So we we parted ways, and she went off to school. And uh, I ended up going to the JC a, a, a mile above where I lived, you know. And uh, but I played football there. And after a couple of years of that, so we didn't see each other for a couple of years. After a couple of years, I I got offered a scholarship to San Jose State. And this time I said, you know, I'm going to take it. You know, the coach just says, hey Pat, you can play, get it. So I went up there and and uh, did spring ball, and and I came home that summer. And then I, I decided I'm gonna connect with Candy again. So I called her up and asked her out, and we spent all summer, we took two classes together at one of the local JCs to pick up some units. And uh, I, I, I worked on her, I said, you know, why don't you transfer to San Jose? And she was just, up, what do you mean? I'm not gonna, you know, you didn't come to Arizona State, now you want me to go to San Jose? No way. And then finally, I, I worked on it. I think part of it was her parents didn't want to pay that out-of-state tuition. So, uh, so she finally said, okay, she transferred to San Jose. Well, then long story short, I came the first game of the season. Um, third play of the game, I got hurt. And it was a big, I blew out my knee, and it was a big injury, and the doctor repaired it. But he says, Pat, he says, your football career is over. And I said, no way, you know, and I had a scholarship, and I, I, I was hurting, you know, I didn't know how I was gonna finish school. Anyway, I rehabbed that knee like crazy, and I got a call from my JC coach that got the job at the University of Hawaii. 
And he said, I want to ask you one question. Can you, can you play? And I'd been rehabbing coaches. I said, I can play, I guarantee you. He says, okay, well, I'm going to offer you a full scholarship to the University of Hawaii. And I said, oh, man, I was just excited. So I went back to the, the Candy's dorm at the sorority house and told her about it. And guess what? She wasn't too happy. <laughs> Again. He said, you're going to go. I just get her to say, I'll say, now you're going, you know, there's no way. I'm not going to marry you. And so I said, you know, finally, I said, I well, you know, we'll see what happens. And uh, so uh, actually, we, I went off to that and, and off to the school and the University of Hawaii. And, and uh, I got really, really hurt and bad uh, as far as missing her. So I called her up on the payphone, you know. I couldn't afford to fly home and propose to her uh, properly. And uh, again, it was the same thing. I told you I'm not going to do it. And it took me three nights and about $18 worth of quarters, you know, to, to, to finally get her to say, okay. And uh, I said, look at and the, the clincher was, hey, you get to live in Hawaii for three years. And, uh, and she said, well, yeah, that, that, maybe that's a good idea. So and that's what we did. So we went home that summer and got married and, you know, ended up going to Hawaii. And it was, it was magic for us. It was just a magical place. Um, and uh, so anyway, we, we did our time there. When it came time to go home, uh, I said, okay, well, we're going to go back to California. I, I had gotten my degree. And uh, so she says, uh, well, I got something to tell you. I said, well, what's that? I'm pregnant. And it was our first, first child. And uh, I go, oh, really? I said, well, that's wonderful. I said, well, we're going to have to go home early and get, get set up in California and get ready. You know, I'm just get a job and and all that stuff, and she just cried. She said, no, 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 I don't want to go back. I want to stay here and live in Hawaii. And uh, I said, I put my foot down. I said, just, Hawaii's too expensive. You know, I, I got a better chance of getting a job in California. You know, I, I was a, a teacher, and I, I was a football coach. We ended up, and so that's what we did. Anyway, so we did that, and, and things went along fine. Alcoholism was nowhere in sight by then. I drank more than she did at the time. And you know, we were like, uh, I don't know, we were probably 24 years old or whatever. But up until she was 30 years old, it was not a problem. But by the time she turned 30, we had our second child and we had bought a new home and uh, we wanted to really, uh, you know, make sure that we absolutely could, could uh, afford everything. So she, she had to go back to work. So, uh, that, that was fine in the beginning. She had a job, she made great money, uh, and every uh, lunchtime she'd go out with her boss, who I found out later was an alcoholic, and they would drink their lunch kind of thing. And uh, you know, she wasn't used to that, but she got used to it. And it wasn't long, it took about six months, and I noticed, oh, wow, what's going on? She's kind of different, uh, you know? And, uh, and I, I said, oh, she's got a problem with alcohol. And uh, I remember we, we had, by this time, we had bought some things. We had a place out at the Colorado River. We had a boat, and life was good. We were going out there, and of course, when you go out to Colorado River on a, on a weekend, you know, you got a couple of cases of beer, and we go out there and party and drink and everything. And we came home one, one afternoon, and of course, that night, we went to bed. And uh, when I woke up, I looked at Candy, and of course, she had drank, the week, and she was hungover. And I looked at her and I said, you look terrible. You know? I said, your eyes are all bloodshot. And I was sincere. I said, how do you do it? And I don't know how you can do that. And, and she looked at me square in the eye and she said, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't think I can stop. And I go, oh my gosh. And in my mind, I said, she might be an alcoholic. And, but it lasted about three seconds because after that, you know what my demeanor was? Well, that's okay because I'm gonna fix it. And that was my journey, starting off. I'm gonna fix it. I knew I could fix it, I knew I had that power, and uh, I thought I had that power. Uh, but, uh, and it, we went almost almost 10 years uh, before, before she finally got sober. And we went to that first treatment center. She finally agreed to do that. And uh, that was a trip, I'll tell you. Uh, we went to, I had to go on the family weekend. This is the Al-Anon part of it now. And, uh, 
we went in there and they said they had a, like a big group. It was um, the uh, counselors and the uh, alcoholics and addicts and the free Al-Anons like me, um, the normies, you know. And uh, so uh, I made the mistake. I sat down right next to the counselor who was leading the meeting and he says, okay, we're gonna start with this gentleman to my left right here. Uh, just tell us your name and tell us how you feel. So I'm sitting there, of course, I'm sitting there like this. My name's Pat, and I feel fine. <laughs> and some of you know what fine is. I'll, I'll clean it up, but it's fine is F-I-N-E, fouled up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Except the first word wasn't fouled up. But uh, so anyway, man, I was seething. You could see the smoke coming out of my ears. And they went around the room, and I, you know, I just was beside myself. I was really pissed, you know, at the, especially at the counselor that he called me out like that. And um, the meeting ended and this cute little girl came over. I mean, when I say little girl, she's probably, uh, oh, I don't know, I guess maybe late 20s, really cute, came over and said, hey, Pat, have you ever heard of Al-Anon? And I said, no, I don't think so. He said, well, it's a program, and I think you might be interested, it might be good for you. I said, really, well, what's it all about? He said, well, I'll tell you what, there's a meeting here tonight in this same room at 7 o'clock. You know, just come back here and you'll find out all about it. And I said, I'll even be here. And, uh, and you, you know, we'll see how you like it. So I said, well, no, I don't think so. So she kept harping on me and finally I said, okay, I'll come. So that's what we did and I got there. And I walked into the room and I, and I saw the people. Of course, back then there wasn't very many men in Allen and there was no one men in this room, with all women. I, mean, I often say the average age was deceased. And they're, they're the same age I am now, you know. And uh, I didn't have a clue, and I, I didn't want to do anything. So anyway, so well, Pat, just go down, have a seat, and oh, you, if you have some questions at the end, we'll, we'll take them. And so the meeting ended, and he said, Pat, would you like to say anything? And I said, well, you know, I see all these things on the wall, these, you know, Steps and traditions, I guess. If you just tell me which one to work that, that'll get my wife sober, I'd be great, really grateful. <laughs> and they all laughed. And, um, and the, one, the one lady in the back said those three words, you know, to me that I was to hear many times. Pat, keep coming back. And uh, I didn't go back to that meeting. But I did, uh, I did finally, you know, I got to the point where I needed to surrender. Uh, I was told that, um, you know, by some women, because I hadn't met any men in Al-Anon yet. And, and uh, so I said, well, I don't even know what that means. means. My dad told me, Pat, you never surrender. You never give up. You never give in. You fight the good fight, you know, and that's the way you do it. You know, he, he was from Kansas and that, you know, a Kansas farmer and man, that's the way you did it. And... Uh, so I said, okay, Dad. And that's, so that's, I stuck to my guns, you know, and I kept, I'm gonna just fight this and I'm gonna get through it. And I still had that feeling that I know I can fix her. I know I can do that. When we grew up together, I knew everything about her. And uh, so and that wasn't to be. Um, so I kept trying and kept trying and kept trying. Well, I finally decided, well, um, I don't know what I'm gonna do. She had gone to treatment center and she, she told you uh, the other night, uh, last night, <laughs> that, uh, that she, uh, you know, was had a problem and, and that um, she wasn't, you know, just couldn't get sober. And uh, so we just kept going. And, you know, she ended up, I told you, she ended up through five treatment centers. And, uh, but I finally, I decided, well, well, I got to the point where I, I don't know what I was gonna do. I thought maybe we weren't gonna make it. I thought maybe we needed to get divorced. And I, I didn't really know that. You know, I really, I, I, I thought I loved her. You know, when I talk about love, we don't, when you're that young, you don't know anything about love. You know, I often say, uh, love is what we did in the back of my 55 Chevy in 1964. And she denies that to this day. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's what I thought love was. And boy, what, you know, what, what a rude awakening I had. And today, I look at it a lot differently, of course. And, um, but I finally said, well, maybe, maybe I'll try Al-Anon. Maybe I'll go in and, and give it a try. 
and that's what I did. And um, of course, I, I didn't get a sponsor right away. I didn't work the steps. I, I still didn't have a clue. I, I didn't know how to surrender, and I didn't think that I really had a problem. Like I told you before, I thought uh, alcoholism was a, a, not a disease, you know. And, and, you know, if anybody wanted to, they could get sober. And I said, look what I did. I, I, I didn't drink for three months, you know. <laughs> and guess what? She wasn't impressed. And, and uh, so that's the way it was. And uh, so it kept getting worse, kept getting worse. She, she'd get 30 days, like she said, go to treatment center. 32 days, she was drunk again. And I just, and of course, all this time, you know, instead of trying to have some compassion and all that, I, I didn't. I just scolded her and, uh, I mean, I never physically touched her, of course, but boy, I just put her down. I said, you know, you can do it if you want to, you know, and blah, blah, blah. I was an SOB is what I was. And, uh, and she, you know, she just, every time that I would do that, you know, she'd, start, she'd drink more. And I, I had a therapist one time who says, why does she do that? And she says, it's real simple. She's drinking at you. You know, the more you ridicule and do that, the more she's gonna drink. And I said, I started scratching my head and I said, wow. I never, you know, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but that really scared me. And, uh, cause I, you know, I really thought I loved her. And I, I think I did, but I didn't know, like I say. So anyway, so we finally went down that road and, and she got to tell you where she finally, um, Getting, gonna get sober. I mean, she started putting some days together. But by that time, I was full of it. I said, I'm not, I can't do this anymore. So I, I left, took the two kids, and went to the apartment, and, and we were out, I probably about seven months. And um, when I was out of the house now, and didn't see her, didn't talk to her, and all of a sudden, uh, it starts raining. <laughs> Okay, well, what do we do here? Keep going, Keep going? okay. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I, I couldn't do it anymore. And uh, so finally, she decided to uh, uh, just go ahead and, and uh, do what she could. And uh, she told you the other night what happened. She, she got, uh, uh, had a problem with, with her uh, mom and she went to a meeting and she had a grand mal seizure and almost died. And uh, she came out of that and she told you it was, it was everything was okay because she finally um, surrendered, she said. And, she, and of course she said that many times, but she really meant it. And uh, she started to get sober. And seven months went by and I finally said, you know what, I, I can't afford this anymore. Uh, I, I had, you know, to pay rent, and I had to pay for the mortgage, and I just ran out of money. And uh, so I finally said, well, I, one of it, I gotta have to move back in. And uh, we, she wasn't real happy about that, but that's what we did. And um, slowly but surely, it starts, she started to get better. She got, she got sober, she got like a month, and I said, well, she gets a month, like no problem. Now she got two months, three months, finally got nine months, and I'm going, no way. And uh, I said, I can't believe it. I said, how can AA get her sober? I couldn't get her sober. There's no way AA could get her sober. And so, uh, but you know, she was doing well. And so finally I started to cave in and I said, okay, I'm gonna get surrender. And I, I went in there and I found a sponsor. I started working the steps. And, uh, and I started to realize, you know, that I, I was in trouble because I was the one that was a problem. I mean, she had her problem, but I had a problem too. And I, I realized that. You know, that surrender was the toughest thing. Um, you know, I, I went to a men's group finally, which it was very helpful. And uh, uh, I went, went in there the first time. And uh, uh, this is in the beginning, and I, oh, my al thing. And I went to the, I went in on a Monday night men's group and I walked in the back of the room and I was late, and of course, and I sat in the very back. And right about that time, there was a gentleman that was getting up to, to say the 12 steps. And uh, so he went up there and he introduced himself and he says, uh, these are, these are Al-Anon's 12 steps. He says, number one, and now this is what he, 
this is what uh, I heard. This isn't what he said, I found out later. But this is what I heard. He says, step one, we're powerless over alcohol and our wives have become unmanageable. <laughs> and I'm going, yes, I knew it. That's it, I found the key, you know. I just have to, have to learn to, make, to, to help her manage it, you know. And of course that wasn't it. But, but that was the start of it. And I, and I couldn't accept that uh, it was a disease. And I heard a uh, oh, father, father, I don't know if it was Father Terry or Father Leo, one of them, both alcoholics and al -Anons, And uh, they were speaking one time and I went to hear them and there's on uh, the difference between spirituality and religion. Because I had a really hard time with step three. And, um, and he explained, you know, religion and spirituality can coexist, okay? But they're not the same thing. And, uh, and that made sense with me, to me. And so I finally started to, to accept that, uh, that alcoholism was a disease. And uh, so what happened was, uh, I started to get better. And uh, I started going to meetings. And Candy and I finally got together. And we started going to a chapter nine meeting, which is a family afterward in, in the big book that most of you know that are alcoholics. And, uh, and so that's what we did. And uh, it was wonderful for us. It brought us together, back together as a family. And uh, I started really working the program. In fact, I started the men's group. Uh, back then, there wasn't very many men in al -Anon. I started a men's group in uh, Southern California, La Canela Men's al -Anon, it's called, and um, that group is still going on. We've been in Utah for eight years now, but that group is still going on. It's a great group. I mean, they have. we started off with six guys, and after, after six or seven years, uh, they had like almost about 80 guys, and uh, it's unbelievable. And I couldn't believe it. So, of course, I'm, I'm not there anymore, but I started another men's group in St. George, and so that's going great, too. Not as big as that one, but anyway. But, you know, that was my problem. You know, the three A's in al -Anon were really big for me. Acceptance, um, I'm sorry, awareness is first, then acceptance, then action. And so I, I if, you know, I couldn't, uh, do to be accepted because I, I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware that I had a problem. But once I did, then I started to accept that it was a disease. And then I had to take the action, which was working the steps with my sponsor and realizing that I have a problem, okay? And I, I need to take care of me and I have to change. You know, and that brings me like to the, the three C's. You know, I didn't cause it, I can't control it, and I can't cure it. And that, that's right, I can't. So I can't fix it, but boy, I sure thought I could, but I find surrender that I cannot fix this. I just gotta take care of me, and Candy's just gonna have to make it on her own, you know? And uh, and it was a slow process, but you know what? She, so that was, she, after that time, she never had another drink to this day, and that was like 33 years ago. So it's just been unbelievable that where, our, where it has worked. But you know, we had, we had some trouble along the ways. I mean, I'll try to speed this up, I guess, a little bit. Uh, so, you know, we had our two children, and Candy mentioned this, so I won't go into it in great detail, but um, our, our son had a problem first, and, uh, and it was, it was kind of like, well, like, you know, it's a disease, and I know it, and he's got it, his mother's got it, he's got it. And uh, so we kind of went through a time period where, he, you know, he got about seven DUIs, and was doing crazy stuff and and uh, we just thought well I, I just kept working my program and leave, leaving them alone because I knew I couldn't fix them just like his mom and finally he came around and it took, took on a while for him but and of course our daughter you heard the story and I'll make this quick too but she she had uh, she got pregnant with her second daughter and she had a real bad uh, problem in the hospital and uh, she had to have medication for it, and really painful. And of course what happened was, she got hooked on the painkillers, and she couldn't quit, she couldn't stop. And it lasted for, I don't know, maybe a couple of years, and uh, 
finally we got that phone call that no parent ever wants to hear that she died of an overdose and boy it just tore me up and it really tore candy up and uh, but you know I can tell you this for a fact Al-Anon and AA were there for us they, they were our pillars if it wasn't for that I don't know what would have happened well, they, they held our hand and hugged us and, and loved us and, and we we got better. I mean, you know, we, we're still dealing with it. We still have our grieving process time at times. But you know what? Without you guys, we, I don't think we'd have made it. And uh, we're just very, very, very fortunate on that. You know, some of the tools I use from some of you that might be interested is, um, what do I do as far as my program? Well, we went, finally went to a couples communication workshop. Uh, Dr. Paul and Max, if you've heard of them, they, they started a a couple uh, communication workshop up in Lake Arrowhead, California. We went to that for probably 20 years, never missed it. And it was wonderful for us because we got to learn to communicate in a healthy way and treat each other with respect and learn how, to, how, how marriage is supposed to work and saved us on that. And that also helped us with our grieving over our daughter. And we've been doing that for a long time now. Um, and uh, it's, it's just been wonderful for us. But you know, uh, Dr. Paul taught me a, a prayer, not a prayer, a way of, of uh, praying. He treats it like a baseball game. You know, home plate is spirituality. So you step up to the plate every morning, I do, and I start my prayers off. And I ask God, I thank him for all, I'm grateful for all the many blessings he's given to me and my family, and more prayers. And then I head off to first base. Now first base is the mental part of my program. and. I need help in that area. Uh, I had back surgery about four years ago, and um, I had right in the middle of surgery, I had a stroke. And luckily it wasn't a major stroke, but it, I do have a little bit of short memory. So I have to really concentrate and focus to, to learn to do that, even like when I get up and speak now. So, uh, but you know, it's, it's getting better, and, and uh, it's, at least it's something that, that, I have to, that, that I have to do. And then I head off to second base. That's the physical part of my program. And, uh, you know, I have to learn to take care of myself. And I learned that you have to, I call it, um, I, I nicknamed it uh, Med uh, News, M-E-D News, N-E-W-S, Med News. And it means monitor energy daily by, by proper nutrition, exercise, water, and sleep. That's what I need to do for me. Whoops, sorry about that. And uh, so, you know, then I head off to third base. That's my emotional sobriety base, where I deal, deal with feelings, which I don't like to do, and I know a lot of men in here could probably identify with that. You know, I didn't know when I was young, I didn't know what feelings were. You know, I, mean, I knew anger and, and hate and things like that, but I, all those things, I mean, I just know where I could deal with them. I'm learning how to do that today. I'm not perfect at it, but I'm getting better. And that, that's progress, not perfection, and that works for me. And then I head back to home to home base, and of course I finished the same way I started. And um, it's spirituality, which is by far the most important base. So that's one of the tools I use. And, uh, but just trying, uh, when I go to a lot of meetings, um, I stay in touch with my sponsor. Uh, I've got a sponsor who's got a sponsor, and that, uh, that sponsor happens to be me. <laughs> So we, we sponsor each other, and uh, I lost my, spon my original sponsor about four years ago, and uh, you know he's back in California, of course. So I, I needed to get another sponsor, and uh, what a terrific man he was to, for me. He just worked with me, never gave up on me, and his story, he had a wife, he and his wife were, had the exact same story Candy and I had, which was wonderful because we got to work together with them, and they were 10 years older than us, so they were, and they were about 10 years ahead of us as far as sobriety and, and, and uh, you know, his time in the, in the analog program. So that, that was a godsend for us. So there's, you know, the one thing I guess I, I want to leave you guys with uh, is the one thing I absolutely know and can tell you honestly that what I found in Al-Anon is hope. You know, hope for me. You know, I, if you'd have known me, you'd say, oh, that guy's never going to make it. <laughs> he's out of it. He's a sicko and he's, he's never going to get well. And I can tell you today, 
I have that hope, you know. I have that faith, and it's growing every day. And I'm, you know, I just know that there's some people here maybe that are new. And don't give up, you know. You got you fight that good fight, like my dad says. Except you don't, you know, you do it with with the program. Make it work for you because it's it's been a wonderful experience for me. Anyway, I think that's it for me. So thanks so much for listening.